bringing you a steady stream of thought-provoking ideas and cutting-edge innovation. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts... Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to the Society in the State podcast. Brian Hyde here along with Connor Boyack. Uh, We are uh, today talking with Dave Staley, who isn't yet but should be a household name for anybody who uh, wants to hear a great entrepreneurial success story, particularly here in the state of Utah. And Dave, there's a lot of different things I can use to describe you, but uh, I I, want to start from kind of an entrepreneurial uh, businessman a builder, a producer kind of uh, place to start. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then let's let's get into this uh, marvelous little company that you have built from an idea into something that's actually making changes throughout the world. Okay, well, you know, that question about who I am, I'm always hesitant to say that what I do and what we've <laughs> accomplished really defines who I am, but um, I'm, a, I'm a little farm boy. How's that? Okay. Now that works. That works for us. I, uh, I grew up in Enterprise, Utah. Um, I was born in 1960, and and actually uh, that just had such an impact on my uh, on my life, really, in the long term. The way that uh, the way I did grow up, and the family I grew up in, and the the observations and and things that we did. You know, it was uh, it was an interesting life. My my mother and dad have 10 children, eight living. Uh, actually, no, I've lost one. My sister since then, I used to say that, so there's seven of us living still, but um, kind of a large family. And uh, my dad was the local postmaster there, but we were raised very conservative. And also um, we didn't have more than we needed for sure, but we we had what we needed. <laughs> And and things were always a little tight, but but my father pr- uh, provided for us well and taught us how to work hard and taught us how to kind of make our own way in life and to make the most out of what we did have. And uh, you know, I was the kind of little kid that I loved playing in the dirt. And uh, when I got big enough, I loved to play with big things in the dirt. After I played with little things in the dirt, but um, one of the things that always was kind of a part of my life was we didn't get a lot of new things that you bought at the store. It was usually kind of a refit, rebuild. Um, If there was a a certain kind of a a toy truck that I had my eye on, I'd take an old one that we had already and I'd just make a new one out of it. And that was kind of the story of my life. Just those kind of little things, you know, an old bicycle made new or a and an old or an old toy made me or whatever it kind of guy and it just became a part of of me and and so I always just had that uh, kind of a creative uh, mentality about me of, of taking something and and refitting it for better uses so Dave and and uh, talking and talking with a lot of entrepreneurs I find the backstory is often very interesting because you see that a person is kind of shaped and you see kind of how their upbringing either has kind of shape their perspective or their belief system or their work drive. Um, and what I find really interesting in that is that people can end up in widely different fields, have widely different talents and innovations, but that that same kind of, you know, undergirding stamina and drive, you know, shapes what they're doing. Uh, but what I also find interesting is that some people, you know, have a very uh, destined track. They're very focused on on one you know product or one industry, and other people kind of stumble into their entrepreneurship. They find a a problem that they solve. You've ended up you you've ended up you know solving a problem. You've ended up satisfying a demand. When when you built your company, which obviously we want you to talk a little bit about what you do and and what the innovation there was. Was this something that you were kind of had your uh, your mind set on figuring out and solving this problem and researching and developing? Or was this something different for you? How did you end up, you know, uh, building the company that you did? Was it kind of, you know, more by accident or was this like thoughtful, careful planning over a long period of time? Um, It was not necessarily the thoughtful, careful planning over a long period of time because I I grew up in the farming industry, you know, in my home valley there. Um, 
just uh, working with different farmers and being involved in forage and in potatoes and, uh, you know, other things, grains and things like that, that we worked around through the years. And it really wasn't until I, um, I actually went to college for a couple of years at, at SUSC, the old SUSC here in Cedar City. But I, after my mission, I did not, um, I just couldn't find my niche quite there. And I really yearned to get back into agriculture. And after having some other work in my early married uh, life, just the first year, uh, and some other things that I did prior to that, I, I just really had a great love for agriculture. And so opportunities came that I um, went back into the farming industry, really just working and enjoying it, but I, I, I was extended an opportunity here in Cedar City in the valley here um, by Brent Hunter Farms to come and manage a little farm here for uh, for him that he had going. And, and it was really a great blessing to us. I came from a farm that was much larger out west here and when it came in here, this was more of a family farm setting and, and we loved every minute of it. We really uh, started raising our family there and raised all of them there. But having management responsibilities uh, more than just working for someone else who was doing management, I was, I was in a management situation here. And that became uh, something that the concerns of harvesting uh, hay, alfalfa hay and other types of forage became a lot more important to me since I was responsible for making decisions, when to go, when to stop, uh, how much to do and when to do it. Um, that's when the problems of, of uh, Mother Nature uh, not cooperating very well with us, with particularly with the hay baling operations, became kind of foremost in my mind. And I didn't really think about it for years, but I did for uh, a year or two uh, trying to figure out a way to resolve the, the problem of having proper moisture in dry forages for baling. Okay. Now you're going to have to so, help some of us, uh, some of us non-farming types understand, um, you know, we see a bale of hay as we're driving down the highway and, and we just assume, well, you know, they cut the plant and they, they, you know, bailed it all up. But there's some very important considerations that, that come into play here. You're mentioning the moisture that goes into this. What happens if there's, too much or not enough moisture when it comes to baling that hay? Yeah, so what you do first is is the hay is cut, laid out uh, in windrows on the ground to allow it to dry and cure down. Um, that takes usually three or four days to get done. Um, usually the hay is then raked uh, two of those windrows into one to make a bigger windrow, completes the dry down process. And then the baling process happens after the, the hay is dry. Um, the problem is that uh, if you bale the hay while it's completely dry, like in the daytime, it will shatter the leaves, it'll knock the leaves off the stems, and it really does a lot of damage to the hay. It makes it unpalatable for one thing to cows. It's kind of like eating the bottom of a cornflakes box. You know, the last, the, the <laughs> last dish is not always as good as the first one. <laughs> so you can kind of relate to that, I think. Um, if the hay is too wet uh, when you bale it, if it either is uh, not dried down completely or has gotten too much natural dew on it, uh, if say in the nighttime or in the mornings, uh, then the hay will spoil and then there's a potential of stack fires, uh, things like that from, from uh, combustion because of the moisture creating heat. And so it's really important that there's a, a pretty narrow window of, of moisture that's tolerable uh, when baling hay, and that usually ranges from about oh, 11 or 12 percent up to about 18 percent moisture. And if you get outside of that window, either on the dry side or on the too wet side, you, you really do have problems with devaluation or uh, spoilage or fires or something like that. Okay, now you were so you that was always a you had an idea though that came um, as a result of needing to find the solution for that perfect amount of moisture. And, and the idea that you saw came from a very unlikely source, but, but it actually has sparked you to, to build a company. Tell us, where did you get your inspiration for this, this problem-solving idea? Well, the inspiration itself came from heaven, I will say that. 
because <laughs> I was really struggling with what to do about this. It was very, very challenging. Uh, we might get one day out of a week or two that was even uh, had the conditions that we could tolerate to bale hay in a reasonable way. So I, I spent some time on my knees and, and this was a question that I brought up and I knew of other ways other people had tried to resolve this problem that really didn't work, but I just prayed and, and said, you know, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, maybe you can help me and get me, you know, help me get some ideas how to resolve this. And it was really interesting because it, it was an answer that when I actually got down and asked about it, <clears throat> it came fairly immediately. And what came to me was a, a recollection of something I had observed in the past. And that was uh, seeing the girls at the taco time restaurant, put these little tortillas that were cold and kind of stiff in these little steamer ovens. Imagine a lot of people have seen that happen. They put them in and they push a little button and it puts a shot of steam into there just for a second or two. And then they pull it out and it's all warm and soft and nice. And that on that's the thought that came to me. And so uh, this was during a very dry period where that answer came. And so the very next morning I, I went out and the hay was just bone dry again. And I put some in a box carefully and brought it into my wife's kitchen and uh, she had a little pressure cooker for canning, and so I put some water in that and got a little piece of rubber hose and put it on the top and fired that thing up and got some steam coming and just directed some of that steam with the little hose into the box of hay. And uh, I, I reached in after just a few seconds of putting that hose in a few spots, and I could not believe the way that that hay felt. It was unbelievable. It was just like the perfect... Um, uh, way that hay should feel when it's bailed and so that was like a very um, a really interesting answer to the prayer and one that worked right off the bat now I didn't know anything about how to make steam or anything but I discovered that there was something a medium that would work to, to get that done. Dave what I what I find super interesting about all this is I know nothing about hay I, I'm not a farm guy you know at all I grew up in San Diego on the beach and uh, and miss it dearly, I should add. <laughs> and and so I don't know, I, I can't relate, right, to what you're saying, but in talking with a lot of entrepreneurs, whether, you know, it's folks who are supporting our organization or friends of mine who are starting their own business, I find this this interesting where everything you just said probably relates very little to most of our listeners. They don't know, hey, but they do know the importance of solving problems. They do understand that the market is all about uh, finding these pain points. And it's amazing the the abundance that can be created out there, the prosperity that can be had, not only for you and your family by solving this problem and, and building a company around it to help others, you know, meet their needs and, and be able to bail hay, uh, but, you know, you're saving those folks a lot of time. You're saving them money. You're saving them mental energy. They're probably very eagerly paying you to solve this problem because it helps them in turn save money and their customers in turn save money. And I think that's such a common thread with entrepreneurs that whether, you know, it's hay or web development or, you know, uh, irrigation lines or, you know, artificial intelligence or whatever, uh, what I see as the common thread in entrepreneurship is solving problems, critical thinking. So maybe let me ask you very briefly, yeah. I hadn't planned on this, but, you know, you, you uh, ascribe some of what you've done to uh, uh, the, the powers of heaven and inspiration. But clearly after that idea came, you had to figure out how to do it. So how important has been uh, critical thinking for you as an entrepreneur? And what are your comments maybe more generally on, you know, do you find that in our education system or in society today that, uh, you know, uh, uh, rising, uh, the rising generation has the right critical thinking, you know, training and abilities to be able to help solve society's problems in the future? Um, I, I, I will address that. I think there's four main pillars and these are ones that I've really given some consideration to, but the first is observation. <clears throat> I'm, I want to say one thing first too, and I don't think, and that is that I don't think the problem is solved in the school. Um, in no matter whether it's a private or a home school or a public school or whatever, I really think it comes from the family culture. And if a family has, uh, a phone or a, a screen in the in the hands of their kids, you know, 80% of the time, they're not going to get it. And uh, it, it comes by observing things, um, by uh, 
maybe having to deal with a few problems when you're young that you find solutions for Mm -hmm. that kind of carries into your life in the future, kind of like I did. And, and then, um, you know, acting on those things and learning to make something out of it and having the support of parents and the encouragement of parents to do that right from the beginning of your life is going to be more setting that culture in your life than anything else. I think now it can be destroyed, I think, in other institutional settings, but I don't, I think it's hard to, to make that out of nothing, right. you know, if you haven't come with some of that there. Now, it, I think it can be developed with good teachers and good uh, educators and whatnot. But, but the, the, that observation pillar is so important. Things you see, it's so unique to each individual. You're the only one in the world that has observed everything you've, you've observed. Mm-hmm. And so the second one is inspiration. Um, in my opinion, you know, God can only work with what we what we're somewhat familiar with in in order to inspire us to put observations together. That's in my case, at least I wouldn't say, I don't know what other people's experience always is, but he certainly inspired me to put some observations together that I already knew and already saw and already had had some exposure to. Uh, The third one is education. I I definitely was not, uh, you know, a highly educated person and still am not, but, the education process is not formal either in life. I mean, some of it is that gets you going, gets you thinking, uh, learning how to learn. But I did have to do something about the inspiration and the observations that I was putting together. Um, I definitely had to educate myself much deeper than I was, which I love doing. (laughs) And the fourth pillar to me is the motivation for what we do. Um, I, I, have never been motivated by money. It has always been resolving uh, the problem and making life better for someone and and for my own situation too. But it's really interesting how motives affect the way that you accomplish certain things. And I think you're blessed so much deeper, uh, even by heaven, if motivations are are more pure and more uh, geared toward something good for the, for the world around you too. And so that's been a big part of what we really ascribe our success to is that we are trying to make things better for people. And so those, I don't know if that kind of gives you an yeah. idea where my mind goes on those subjects. This is, this is where I'd I, like I to, feel. this is where I'd like to shift gears, Dave, and maybe in our last five minutes here, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, that you took an idea that solved problems, and you have, I mean, this, this is the epitome of the American dream. You've turned it into a company that is providing jobs there in southern Utah, that is providing value for the farmers around the world that are beginning to use this technology. And, it, you know, people look at that, and I know there are some who will say, well, he just got luckier. He just, you know, he was born into a better, somewhere the word privilege might be thrown around. But the truth of the matter is, you've put a lot of hard work into this, and there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and so at this point, I want to ask you to, to give us some insights on, on what business owners, people who have built a successful business as you have, wish that uh, their employees and maybe others in the public understood or wish that they better knew about what it means to, to be a business owner. You mentioned that money really isn't a powerful motivation for you. Um, I'm sure with the success your company has seen, you could be living a much elevated lifestyle from from what you grew up with or what you've been used to. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if that was the choice I made, absolutely. But you don't. Um, no, I, I don't really. I don't think I'm any different than I used to be. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I would like to address that. Um, you know, I used to work for wages uh, through a good share of my life, and I had no idea the impact of, of our um, our political structure and our tax structure and all of those things, I really did not understand the impact that that had on people who were common people in a small business even, or a medium-sized business or whatever. Uh, I think the thing that really started hitting me is as our, as we became fairly profitable, um, which are, we were very fortunate. We've been very fortunate and very blessed to be able to really prosper in what we're doing. Um, 
but we we dump a lot of of the profits back into the company. We, I don't owe money to anyone. Um, I don't have a big loan out on anything uh, at all. But that's because we just started by, um, I guess why I think wisely uh, building this, and you can't always do that, but. The interesting thing about it is, is that as we've as we've prospered, we've learned how much <laughs> how much we end up having to fork over to to Uncle Sam in in taxes. And I might not be the smartest business guy in the world. In fact, I know I'm not. And a lot of guys will say, if you're working credit, you do better. Well, I don't like being in debt. Um, but it's been really interesting over the last few years, uh, especially as as we've done well, that nearly half of our net income goes to taxes when you add the state and federal and, and, and that's just the income tax side. That's not the other stuff like property taxes and things like that. And we have a good team of accounting and tax professionals that really help us a lot to minimize those as much as we can. But it is unbelievable the amount of money that we that we pay in taxes because of uh, being a profitable company. Um, I have, you know, I, I will tell, I will say that almost, you know, over the last uh, three, four years, five years, I normally pay about five to 10 times as much in tax as I pay myself in wages wow. as the owner of the company. And that's no kidding but that's the way the tax structure has been. And it has limited our ability to grow quicker, to do more research and development on new projects. If I could take, you know, a million dollars a year out of the taxes that I pay and put them into uh, research and development, new facilities, uh, employee uh, hires, those kind of things, we definitely could grow a lot quicker than we're growing and, and bring new things to the market. Well, and you see with the reality of it, you see with the recent uh, tax reform, a lot of companies repatriating their money, right. giving bonuses, increasing, um, you know, the lowest wage for entry level employees. And, and really, you know, for all the social justice warriors and the more kind of progressive liberals who were trying to use government to just coerce business owners to do these things, you see that when they can keep their own money, they want to reward employees. They want to pay them more, incentivize them, pay more than competitors. And so the market can handle that once the market has the profit it needs to be able to accomplish that rather than having the big tax burden. And I find, Dave, also in my experience with entrepreneurs is a lot of them that just kind of stumble into solving a problem don't realize as you know, you've had to learn all of that tax burden, the compliance costs, the complexity that they have to deal with as a result of their success. You know, you think that they can just go about building their business, growing a company, serving others, and yet so much of your mental energy and your money is tied up in things, um, you know, that the government requires of you. And so it becomes a, a big burden. I, I appreciate, Dave, we have to wrap it up there for time, you sharing some insights because um, you're in a unique experience where you've been able to grow something very successfully um, and you have kind of an interesting background that has led you to that point, but then also your insights about what it's like to actually have that burden that you deal with. Um, and, you know, for our part, trying to decrease that burden with our work and allow the free market to actually be a little more free. We like to, I guess, call it the free market, but it's not so free. Um, you know, trying to do our part so that business owners like you can can succeed and prosper and help solve problems and, and uh, help society. So thank you, Dave, for, for joining us today on Society in the State. We appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. Thank you.